Hello, everybody. I'm going to be there today and the material at the moment, so I have to do with the Unicode presentation. But I'm really happy to, to be able to be part of this wonderful symposium for Jane. Uh, Jane is my PhD supervisor, and I'm sure, like all the Jane's students, uh, I feel very privileged and fortunate to have had such a supportive, knowledgeable, attentive, passionate supervisor. Um, and I'm sure these two days are going to be packed full of fantastic talks that celebrate Jane and Jane's incredible career. So today I'm going to be looking at uh, case marking and thematic relations in Anandiyakwa. And as I'm going to discuss Anandiyakwa being a head marking language, it has its core items cross reference in the verb. And as such, case marking is used mainly to express semantic and abnormal functions. Um, but there are particular instances where the case marking system can be involved in marking grammatical relations. And so this is where you know, the talk is going to focus in on looking at how um, these yeah, case markers can be co opted to mark grammatical relations, particularly with respect to object arguments. So, a bit of an overview to the talk, I'll start with a typological background about Anandiyakwa and some information about the data and methods that I've used. Then I'll overview the inflectional verbal system, um, showing particularly how the core arguments are encoded through portmanteau prefixes in the verb. And then the central part of the talk is going to look at, um, in particular, three case studies that are frequently involved in marking grammatical relations and um, how, how these case studies are used. And then I'll provide some uh, yeah, concluding remarks. So, and the Yagua is a Dominguean language spoken by the one or other people of Group Island Archipelago. It's a fairly vibrant language. It's still spoken by over 1,400 people and is one of the tertiary languages that's still being applied by children and by first language. Typologically, and the Yagua is a polysynthetic language. It's um, fairly morphologically complex, um, like many non common English languages. It's a head marking language, and so the core arguments are marked on the verb. And the verb is the most elaborate, complex uh, word class in the language. Um, it involves um, multiple discontinuous morphs to express noun categories, it's a productive noun incorporation system. There's various other argument changing affixes in the, in the verb template as well. We can see some of these features in these couple of examples on the screen. So we've got the portmanteau prefixes, um, marking person, number, transitivity, um, and these then uh, combine with the TAM suffixes to express the spectral temporal modal categories. Um, in these couple of examples, we can see we've got uh, incorporated nominals and we've got uh, the derivational affixes there as well. So putting this into a little bit of perspective in terms of um, the wider Australian literature and background. Um, we know that Australian languages have received lots of attention over the, the years with respect to grammatical relations, um, descriptively, analytically, theoretically, and particularly with topics like constituency, configurationality, uh, case marking systems. And um, Anandir Yagwa um, demonstrates many of these sort of notable properties that have been discussed in the literature. But again, what we're most interested in today is going to be the, the case marking system, how that intersects with the system of argument marking um, on the verb. In terms of data, um, the data, this study is run primarily from a corpus I collected between 2016 and 2019 um, using a variety of methods, um, but particularly semi structured um, elicitation. Um, and so, in particular, for this, um, study uh, they use a series of um, uh, picture stimuli 30 images um, that targeted a number of transitive and transitive predicates and this was carried with seven speakers and then alongside this um, uh, some uh, questionnaire um, uh, sort of data looking at grammaticality judgments of speakers as well and so all of this work stems and builds upon work by Barry Land and Edmund, one of Jane's PhD students, um, and some work that I've done as well. So let's start with a bit of a background to the intersection of the verbal system. And so as we've said, being a head marking language, we have core arguments encoded through verbal inflectional marking. Um, and as such, core arguments don't in principle receive case 
So we have the transitive subject and transitive subject and the patient um, object um, arguments um, obligatorily expressed using a series of portmanteau prefixes, where at most two arguments uh, can be cross referenced on the verb. So for verbs with more than two arguments, uh, transitive predicates, um, one of these arguments is unable to be expressed on the verb and has to be um, expressed using uh, free and nominal. Um, so we also have sort of in between um, intransitive and transitive verbs, various intermediary categories, uh, semi-transitive and complete object verbs. So what we'll do now is just take a closer look at some of these different transitivity categories and um, look at some examples to help spell that out. So if we start with intransitive verbs, so we have these morphologically intransitive verbs that take a single um, argument, the subject arguments. So here we can see in this example where we've got um, sort of feeling sad, whatever, what are you um, marked with the like, third person masculine subject. We look at um, morphologically transitive verbs. So these now encode a subject and object argument. Um, so here in this example, we've got third person masculine subject and vegetable noun class object being marked on the verb. Um, and if additional, um, if the argument additionally occurs three nominals, of course, then you should take um, case marking. Okay, so. Some verbs are morphologically intransitive, but can also have a sort of object um, sort of exterior to the verb. So these are like semi transitive and cognate object verbs. So the semi transitive verbs. These are these sort of intermediary between fully transitive and fully intransitive, um, where we sort of just mark morphologically the subject on the verb, like in this example where we've got the second person singular subject, um, but then the, the object is sort of option more of, often um, with these, um, these types of, types of um, predicates, we have the object marked with an allotted case marker. So we'll come back to that in a second as well. Um, we also have these cognate um, object verbs. So another example of morphologically intransitive verbs that can occur with a cognate direct object that's um, not cross-referenced on the verb, and that occurs without case marking generally. So here we can um, compare two examples. We've got the first um, with the verb to bite, I know, where this is a morphologically transitive verb, so we've got the, the subject and the object both marked there. Um, but the second example with Alibara to eat, um, here this is a morphologically intransitive verb where we just got the subject marked and the verb there. Um, but then we've got the sort of this, this object which occurs um, as a free nominal. I'll look at another example here. We have the nominal hammer to, to sing a song. Again, where um, to sing is intransitive, morphologically intransitive, like just the subject, but we've then got end of our, the song um, exterior to the verb. As we said before, as well, we've got transitive predicates, so we can only cross reference two arguments. And so one of the object arguments um, has to be marked outside of the verb. Um, so in these instances, the indirect object is marked on the verb, um, and the direct object occurs as a pre nominal in the form outside. Verbal complex. And the indirect objects can very good take uh, case marking um, predicates as well, or other cases, which we're going to come to in this next section. So, in sum, we've got uh, argument structure um, through from the prefixes, um, where we've got an intransitive series of prefixes. And the transitive series of prefixes like the subject and object, and with dry transitive verbs, um, again, the subject and the indirect object are marked by these prefixes in the verb, and the direct object is to occur as a free nominal outside of the verb. And then we also have various intermediary categories between fully intransitive and fully transitive categories. All right. So now we'll come to, I guess, the, the, the core part of this presentation, looking at the um, how case marking can play into this. So as we 
said is not in, isn't generally employed to express um, this information about broad grammatical relations, but rather to indicate semantic roles, um, to also to indicate um, abnormal case functions, so relating two main phrases to one another, um, and also um, attaching to full inflected verbs um, to mark adverbial subordinate clauses. Um, but as we indicated, um, there are instances where case marking is associated with marking of grammatical relations, particularly with respect to that translate um, and particular types of um, uh, transitive and semi transitive verbs. And as we'll see, this um, case marking is variable, but it's often predictable and dependent on a number of different properties, particularly the, the type of verb um, and properties like animus and inanimacy in of the argument. And so this is what we're going to focus in on for the rest of the talk, um, examining um, in particular these three uh, case codes that are on the screen here, um, the, the allative one, locative manja, and dated ablative one more. So we'll start by looking at the locative and allative, um, which are the two case markers that are most frequently called to express grammatical relations. Um, and so this generally occurs when marking the, um, the recipients, so um, particularly with flat transitive verbs um, and also, also semi transitive verbs that are um, expressing things to do with vocalization, cognition, perception, things like that. Um, so here we've got. Um, some examples. So when we are marking the, the, the recipients um, medic roles, um, often we can use or well, we see both this locative manja and allative one case codes um, uh, on, on that recipient um, the medic role. Um, so with these types of diatransitive verbs as we, we've discussed, um, it's just the, the subject and the indirect object that's marked from the verb. So all arguments can additionally occur as free on the outside of the verb complex, um, but it's the, the direct object um, with the only one that sort of has to be expressed outside of the verb. Um, and so in order to distinguish between like, the recipient and, um, and females of roles, for instance, um, the, the locative and allative in case credit can be employed to mark the recipient role. Um, but this case marking is variable, as we can see in these examples. So the verbs like to give, um, to quoi, involving transfer of motion, there's a lot of variability uh, between the marking of the recipient, um, between taking manja one or taking no case marking credit. Um, so in, in this example, for instance, um, um, with a, Certain speakers describe the same um, event where one man is giving a rock to another man. Um, we've got five instances where the recipient was marked with the allative one, one instance with manja, and four with no case marking. Um, so we have this sort of variation across speakers, but all speakers accept all three options. And so while optional, it appears that um, in addition to sort of marking that recipient. Um, role, the case clinics are also reflecting the way that the transfer is framed. So, for instance, if the focus is on the agent and the action of the giving, um, then the allative is um, likely to be employed, while if the focus is on the agency of the recipients, and also much of the act of giving, then the locative um, manja case clinic is likely to be employed. Um, but as we just saw, um, uh, just as likely, um, that no case marking credit will, um, will be used. And interestingly, this contrasts with uh, some observations um, of that egg marks. Um, we found no instances of recipients of a um, give with um, sort of omitting the, the case marking credit. Um, whereas in the data that, um, yeah, that I looked at, um, it was fairly frequently omitted. So with verbs like put, a comma, on the other hand, um, we have to exclusively marking of the indirect object with the, the locative, the manja, but it, 
which is hardly surprising given the semantics of the um, like quotes, which are generally inanimate or at least non agentic objects. Um, and other accountative verbs like the show, um, the indirect object generally takes in lower case non emphatic, but speakers accept um, manda and why as well. So, um, in most cases, but it seems to be preferred for those kinds of verbs. Similarly, if we look at um, verbs of vocalization, cognition, and perception, um, we also get this sort of optional locative and analytic case marking. Um, so, regardless of the transitivity of the verb, we have bad transitive verbs like tell and tell, maka, transitive verbs like ask, intransitive cognate object verbs like um, speak and tend to listen. Um, and with all of these, we can have this optional marking of the, um, uh, the object. Um, and again, we have this variability between Mandela and no case not completed. And similar to the verb to transfer that we just looked at, um, here um, we're not only sort of marking the recipient's semantic role, but also the directionality of the, the event, sort of the way that the the verbal or cognitive or perceptive event is being um, portrayed. And so, sort of nuanced differences between you know, like talking to somebody and talking at somebody, for instance. Um, but these sort of more fine grained distinctions between like manja and wa um, in these types of you know, cognitive perceptive um, verbs need to be looked at in, in more detail. All right. Again, similarly, if we look at intransitive um, cognate object verbs associated with motion and directionality, um, these can also optionally take um, uh, this um, poetic marking on the, um, on the object, um, but in these cases, only additive case marking. Um, so again, um, yeah, here we can see this optional marking on, on the object human that so hunting the turtle. Um, and again, it looks like um, you get more association if, um, if there's sort of directionality towards a goal uh, or something, um, then then we'll have to take that out of the case marking and if not, we'll to leave it off. Um, another distinctive instance of object marking occurs with uh, the locative, the manta case um, critic, um, involving verbs of surface contact. So um, we have this kind of differential object marking, which isn't uncommon across linguistic thing, um, but in an Indian language, it seems to be motivated by two primary factors: so the uh, animacy of the object and the duration and nature of the contact involved between the subject and the object. So with um, objects of um, close surface contact, um, which take human reference. Um, objects, um, we get sort of obligatory manja marking, um, locative marking, like in these examples. So the girl biting the boy, where the, the boy here um, obligatorily needs to take that locative marking, while um, other animate objects prefer the locative marking, but it's not obligatory, and um, inanimate objects sort of optionally occur with or without the locative marker. And so we have verbs with close or longer lasting contact and more likely to take the um, locative object marking. So um, with verbs like bite, push, pull, kiss, hit, um, so these kinds of verbs, this is obligatory with human reference objects. Um, yeah. And then with these, with other verbs whose contact is more fleeting, so we have a verb like oak or ta, um, then this marking is optional, so including for human um, reference objects. And if we look at um, verbs involving sort of distant or indirect contact, so for instance, like washing or painting, um, here we have an optional. Um, uh, look at it, uh, it occurring on, on the object argument, regardless of human reference or animacy. 
Uh, so like we've got here with the object baby, um, which can go with or without the, the locative margin. So sort of in sum here with the um, with these types of um, surface contact verbs. Um, so we can have this um, uh, locative margin on the, on the object, um, you know, from close surface contact verbs to in, indirect or more distant contact. Um, but the whether the uh, object is, is not or, or not is motivated primarily by the animacy of the object and the duration and nature of the contact between the agent and the recipient. So, for instance, there was some sense speakers with respect to the obli um, obligatory nature of marking um, human reference objects arguments with, with the locative for verbs involving sustained or direct contact. Um, but with respect to um, uh, yes, verbs involving brief or intermittent um, contact um, or involving non-human objects, um, then the, um, the marking was optional with some speakers showing their preference um, for that differential object marking, while other speakers um, use the only very infrequently. Um, so, yeah, more, more research needs to be done to look at that individual speaker variability uh, more clearly. All right, just quickly coming to this um, data evaluative um, clinic which is a little bit more straightforward in terms of its grammatical case um, functions. So um, this landmark clinic has fairly wide ranging semantic and abnormal functions, but grammatically um, it's used to mark the beneficiary, cause, and purpose or intent, as we can see in these three examples. Then I want to one example of um, this clinic um, as marking the recipient of the day transitive verb, um, but this is the only instance in that they want data, um, and I don't have any instances either, um, only with one and manja as the recipient of our transcript verbs. Um, and speakers don't accept this, the speakers that I've um, worked with. So if one more can be used in this capacity, it's very uh, peripheral and infrequent. Similarly, uh, that everyone uh, looks at uh, these three credits, locative, allative, and um, ablative. Um, in being able to disambiguate between transitive subjects and objects in cases where the prefixes don't make this clear. So like we can see in these examples, um, where the portmanteau prefix, um, it's not clear whether the third person, we have the same marker for um, what if, if we're talking about a third person augmented subject and third person masculine object or vice versa, third person masculine subjects and third person augmented object. And so in cases like this, um, there are these couple of examples in legacy material um, where it appears that these case marking clinics are used to disambiguate the, the subjects and objects. Um, however, there are only yeah, these sort of couple of examples um, in legacy material from the 1970s. Um, and these types of examples are rejected um, these days um, with all the speakers that I've worked with. Um, instead, rather, the people um, would use other ways of disambiguating the agent and patient arguments, things like change of phenomenon to much of its quantifiers. So um, potentially in the past, um, this was a very fruitful use um, of, of these um, clinics, um, but it definitely doesn't seem to be current nowadays. Okay, just to sum up. Um, so I've looked at these three case marking critics, but particularly the um, locative and the palliative, um, whose primary um, functions are like semantic, um, semantic relations, but they can be co-opted in a number of ways um, to express um, grammatical relations. And this is most evident with respect to object arguments, um, what we saw particularly with the locative and the palliative involved in a number of um, uh, sort of object marking, particularly with by transitive verbs of transfer, um, verbs of vocalization, cognition, and perception, uh, verbs of motion and directionality, and uh, contact surface verbs as well. And so, um, while this work has provided a bit of an overview of some of these key areas, um, there's clearly lots of um, further research to do. We 
get a more comprehensive picture about this, in particular, to understand the very nuanced semantic differences between, for instance, the optional minor versus one marking um, on recipients of those transfer, um, and also in these cases, there was a lot of um, speaker variability. So, like with the optional vocative marking on um, objects of so, um, surface contact verbs as well. I'll leave it there for today. So, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, please send me any questions or comments to, to this uh, email address. But thank you very much. <laughs>